Good afternoon. I'm Mary Crossley, and I'm a professor here at the School of Law. And I'm really pleased to welcome you all to the program this afternoon, where we'll have the opportunity to consider what tolerance means. This program falls under the umbrella of Pitt's Year of Diversity, a full academic year of programming that explores the significance of difference in creating learning communities and in preparing students to value unfamiliar experiences. This includes differences across race, gender expression, veteran status, disability status, politics, ethnicity, religion, and social inequalities. Tolerance is doubtless an essential precondition to the more expansive concept of diversity, which accepts, welcomes, and celebrates the wide range of experiences, perspectives, and cultures that exist at Pitt and in the broader communities that we are all a part of. But talking about tolerance in the abstract is easy. Figuring out what it means and giving it life in concrete situations can be more challenging. We could have chosen any number of contexts for exploring what tolerance means. In a rapidly changing and mobile society, the need for tolerance arises regularly. Today, though, we're focusing on what tolerance means in the context of the tension existing between the rights of LGBT persons to marriage equality and the religious liberty rights of persons who maintain a commitment to traditional marriage based on their religious beliefs. But I kind of bet that our conversation today, our dialogue will end up being more broad ranging. We're fortunate to have speakers today who've given the questions that we're gonna be discussing, questions about diversity and tolerance, a good deal of thought in their professional and their personal lives. I'm gonna be introducing them just very briefly so as to leave more time for both them to speak and for you all to ask questions afterwards. But before I introduce them, I want to make sure everyone in the room is aware that not only um, will the dialogue be occurring in this room, but it will also be occurring virtually. Uh, tweet your ideas, your reactions, or your questions to at tolerance means during today's panel. Um, and you will have a chance to win a $250 social engagement prize. There's no limit on the number of submissions, so the more you tweet and respond, the greater your chances of winning the prize. Uh, do keep in mind that the hashtag alone uh, won't necessarily get it to us in time, so make sure that you tweet to at tolerance mean, um, means. So let me tell you about our speakers. And I will tell, um, introduce them in the order in which they will speak, and then I'll sit down and they will each have a chance to speak before we take questions. Professor William Eskridge is the John A. Garver Professor of Jurisprudence at Yale Law School. His primary legal academic interest has been statutory interpretation, and he is also a leading expert on LGBT rights. In the early 1990s, Professor Eskridge represented a gay couple suing for recognition of their same-sex marriage. And since then, he has published a field establishing case book in the area, three books, and dozens of law review articles that set out a legal and political framework for the proper state treatment of sexual and gender minorities. He's currently working on a book with Professor Wilson um, entitled Faith, Sexuality, and the Meaning of Freedom. Professor Robin Fretwell Wilson is the Roger and Stephanie Joslin Professor of Law at the University of Illinois College of Law, and she's an expert on religious freedom. Professor Wilson is the author of eight books, including Same-Sex Marriage and Religious Liberty. In addition to being a prolific scholar, Professor Wilson has worked extensively on state law reform, most recently helping the Utah legislature enact anti-discrimination legislation that balances LGBT rights with religious liberty protections for traditional marriage. We also are really happy to have two students with us who were selected based on their essays on what tolerance means to them. First, we'll speak Chris Talbot, a senior psychology and philosophy double major at the University of Pittsburgh. While at Pitt, Chris has been active in Beta Theta Pi fraternity and the Pitt Public Debate Society and has been an undergraduate researcher on numerous psychological studies. In his freshman year, Chris was one of five students named as a Nordenberg Scholar 
and in his junior year, he was named a university scholar um, for ranking in the top 2% of students in the Dietrich College of Arts and School of Arts and Sciences. Chris cares deeply about issues of social justice and directs much of his learning towards American history, social psychology, and the law. His career plans include becoming a lawyer and a law professor. His current plans are to attend Yale Law School, where I bet he'll try to get into one of Professor Eskridge's classes. And then our final speaker will be David Givens, who's a PhD candidate specializing in medical humanities. His dissertation within the Department of Religious Studies examines resiliency and novel devotional narratives among LGBTQ Catholics. He works as the project director for the HIV Prevention and Care Project in the Graduate School of Public Health, where he oversees statewide planning and novel interventions, as well as capacity building and stakeholder engagement efforts around HIV and vulnerable communities in Pennsylvania. He also serves as the associate director for Pitt's Center for Mindfulness and Consciousness Studies. He's been an active presenter and author on topics relating to his work. While at Pitt, David has served as the graduate, in the graduate student government in several roles, including as president, and he also helped found the citywide Pittsburgh Student Government Council and City of Pittsburgh's Nightlife Safety Initiative. In recognition of these contributions, he received the Graduate Student Leadership Award from the University of Pittsburgh, but he considers his greatest honor to be being the proud parent of his and his wife's two sons. So I will turn it over to Professor Eskridge to start us off. Thank you, much. Thank you so much. Well, it's an incredibly great honor to be here today to participate with Robin Wilson, who's a very good friend and colleague. Um, appreciate Mary's wonderful introduction. And most moving, actually, is meeting these two young scholars who are already significant figures and are going to be leaders in the worlds of law and medicine and public health policy, I'm sure, for decades to come. So congratulations, University of Pittsburgh, which I discovered today was founded in 1787, making this one of the oldest universities in the country. Now here's something that's not too old, and that's the issue of marriage equality. Uh, it broke onto the public horizon, uh, really in a minor way in the 1970s, and in a more major way in the 1990s. Uh, and I wanted to start my presentation with giving you the human faces of some of the people that we're talking about who were early advocates and plaintiffs in some of the marriage equality lawsuits. Uh, and we start with the first lawsuit, uh, Jack Baker proposed to Mike McConnell in 1967. So they've been together now 50 years. This is their 50th anniversary as a committed same-sex couple. They obtained a marriage license, which has never been recognized by the state of Minnesota in 1971. Uh, they're still together, happily married. They lost their first lawsuit. About the same time, Donna Burkett, who's actually uh, on the right, and Mononia Evans got married in Milwaukee, Wisconsin filed a lawsuit. Uh, Mononia's father kidnapped her and sent her to Alaska. So that couple did not last. Another couple is very famous. Nania Bayer and Janora Dansel were one of the Hawaii couples in the famous Hawaii lawsuit, which in 1993 rocked the country with the Hawaii Supreme Court's declaration that this is a sex discrimination that the state had to show a compelling state interest to justify. Uh, this was the trigger for the Defense of Marriage Act, President Clinton's most squalid legacy, uh, and a number of uh, anti-gay uh, marriage uh, statutes and constitutional amendments in various states. Uh, the next couple is Holly and Julie Goodridge, and that's their daughter, Annie. <clears throat> and at one corner is Mary Bonato, their lawyer, who also argued the Supreme Court case. Uh, they were successful in Massachusetts. They were one of the first couples with children to be suing. Uh, and the most recent couple to sue, and one of the victorious couples in Obergefell, are April DeBoer and Jane Rouse. And here is a picture of them with their three children in 2013. They now have two more children and are happily raising a family of five flourishing children. Here's the Obergefell Court, nine elderly Supreme Court justices, uh, and since 2015, We've had marriage equality in all states. 
Now, as you might know, Pennsylvania was a little bit ahead of the curve, not much. Uh, Pennsylvania has been issuing marriage licenses since May of 2014 uh, because Governor Corbett announced that discrimination in marriage rights could not successfully be defended in court. He'd lost at the trial level and decided not to appeal. Uh, now, in that period, to my knowledge, and this is true in other states as well, no church has or will be required to celebrate same-sex marriages. This will be entirely voluntary. And no church that I know of has or will lose its tax exemption for that reason. My article in Robbins and my book is going to defend the proposition that as a matter of policy and as a matter of constitutional law, churches cannot lose their tax exemption for this reason. Uh, and part of the reasoning is based upon this famous Supreme Court case, the Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church case. Uh, where the Supreme Court held that the religion clauses bar the federal government from applying anti-discrimination laws to church personnel decisions regarding its ministers and its sacraments. Uh, on the other hand, even though it's true that same-sex marriage per se does not clash directly with religious liberties, surely you've read about some of the cases, the baker, the photographer, the floor shop, that cater only to different sex weddings. These cases are brought under laws that bar discrimination by businesses on the basis of sexual orientation. So not based on marriage equality, and indeed most of the cases didn't involve civil legal marriages, but often involved commitment ceremonies, etc. Uh, these are the religion equality clashes that tend to be occurring. Now your state, and this is not unusual, has no statewide sexual orientation anti-discrimination law. But you do have approximately 34 municipalities, including Pittsburgh here, that do have such laws. So you have a great deal of heterogeneity and non-uniformity in the state of Pennsylvania. Some of the municipal laws sweep very broadly, including, at least on their face, religious institutions. Uh, others do not, and of course, most of Pennsylvania does not have any coverage. One rational approach to this heterogeneity would be to resolve potential clashes in the Pennsylvania legislature, and this is part of our project, to initiate a dialogue, or maybe a trialogue, uh, for thinking about uh, the demand for legislative action. And you all, many of you very young, are where much of the action is. Now here are some of the issues that might be addressed by the legislature. First. What is covered by the anti-discrimination law if it's extended to sexual orientation minorities and gender identity minorities? Will public accommodations be covered? How broadly are we going to define public accommodations if they include uh, sexuality and gender minorities? Uh, should there be or will there be an exemption for religious organizations? How broadly should it be defined? In other words, would it include Catholic charities an independent organization controlled by the Catholic Church, as well as the Catholic Church itself. What about religious schools? What about quasi-religious schools? Schools that seem secular, but have a religious connection. Another issue the legislature can address is what about other exemptions? Small employers are usually exempt from state anti-discrimination laws. Ditto for small landlords. What about allowances? For example, allowances that uh, enable employers to provide health insurance to designated beneficiaries rather than spouses. This is an allowance that the Catholic Church came up with in the 1990s. Uh, now here's an example of a very red state, much redder than you all, where a conflict between uh, rights for LGBT couples and religious liberty was successfully negotiated within the legislature, and Robin Wilson was a big part of that. And the photograph I have there is the Utah governor holding up the anti-discrimination law uh, uh, surrounded by openly straight Mormon Republicans <laughs> celebrating gay rights. Who knew? Uh, how do you replicate the Utah Compromise? What kind of process would this be involved? And it's a process we would invite you to become involved in. Uh, in our opinion, uh, the process would entail the following. Uh, first of all, good faith negotiation among key stakeholders, and by that I mean stakeholding groups, you know, people as well as organizations. So churches and religious groups, uh, LGBT supportive 
and civil rights groups, civil rights groups of all kinds, women's rights, uh, African-American civil rights, Latino Im immigrant rights, etc., and businesses. Secondly, it is very useful and probably necessary to have leadership by key political leaders, maybe constituents of some of you or some of your relatives. Uh, legislators, governors, often mayors, administrators can take leadership roles here. Uh, and then these kind of negotiations also should involve, successfully involve, creativity. Uh, and that is, think outside the box. Think about new ways to accommodate traditionalist religions and LGBT persons and relationships. Uh, the hope is uh, that the couples that I've been talking about, and we're going to conclude with them, uh, would be able to have their relationships recognized not only as marriages, but with anti-discrimination protections for the uh, uh, in employment, in housing, perhaps in public accommodations, and we're talking about not just the couples, but their families. This is a picture I took of April DeBoer and Jane Rouse uh, and their uh, daughter, Ryan. Again, they have five children. And when they were married, the couple exchanged vows between themselves. And then each spouse exchanged vows with each of the children that they were committing themselves not just to one another as a committed relationship till death do us part, but each spouse, mother, parent was committing herself to the children that they were raising jointly. Uh, and one failed presidential candidate said it takes a village uh, and it, it does take an entire community uh, in supporting families such as these. I want to say amen to that. Let me see if the most successful part is I can make that work. So um, for the winner of the Social Engagement Prize, by the way, you'll get a note about seven minutes before the end of the, of the event um, that said that you were randomly selected <coughs> and then to see me because I'll have a, a paperwork and some forms for you. So I wanted to thank the law school, the University of Pittsburgh in particular for bringing so many people here and so many uh, interesting voices to the table. Uh, I want to thank especially Bill for being a wonderful colleague. Uh, it's a lovely opportunity to see colleagues like Deborah um, and Mary Crossley I hadn't seen for a while. But probably most compelling to me was um, reading the essays, uh, not just from the two winners, but the whole set of essays that were submitted. And it, there isn't so often that I think, I really wish I had written that. I wish I had said that. And I think you'll see that uh, in just a second that David and Chris are gonna smoke me and Bill, um, and that would be fine. I think that would be a good outcome. Okay, so Bill has already touched on at least one of the issues I wanted to talk about, but I wanna talk about looming collisions, not to make it too graphic. But we have a question here. Are we going to have train wrecks to trains that are on a path and they're just going to collide. Are we going to do something to take them off this collision course? And I want to talk about three specific places where I think we have to think hard about whether there is a natural train wreck unfolding in front of us. Or are we going to do something about it? And the three things are going to be benefits, bakers, and bathrooms, okay? I'm going to get to bakers if I have time, but at least benefits and bathrooms. So Bill mentioned the fact that, you know, well, let me just ask you, how many people have seen a headline like this? Somebody gets married, they go to their employer, and that's the moment when they get fired. Now, some folks say, oh, marriage equality actually hastened this collision. It caused this outcome, but that's not really true. It's marriage equality was the opportunity or the occasion for somebody's sexual partner, married partner relationship to come to the attention of an employer. It wasn't caused by marriage equality itself. Now, a lot of folks that I talk to just think that employers should get over this, right? That they don't really have an interest in your marriage. It's a civil marriage. Who are they to make distinctions? Where are they coming from? And in any event, this marriage can't possibly hurt them. Now, at least some religious employers, I believe, 
in good faith really are struggling. They have a commitment to their employees to provide health care. That's a good to them. They actually feel religiously like they need to do this for their employees. But at the same time, they feel that if they write coverage for same-sex spouses, that brings them into the bucket of recognizing spouses and their marriages that they cannot recognize as a matter of faith. Not necessarily because they have any animus towards the person in front of them, but because they have a vision from God about what marriage is supposed to be and how they shouldn't think of that. Now, I see some folks not buying that account, right? That's hard to buy for folks who don't already buy it. I understand that. But if we take it seriously, the state can actually provide good outcomes here, can put employers in the position of continuing to write those policies. So for example, we learned this long before same-sex marriage in California with domestic partnerships. And what happened there is there were religious employers that did not feel like they could write a same-sex domestic partnership coverage. So what did they do? They agreed with the city of San Francisco to write an employee plus one. Tell me your name, sir. Your name. Ryan. Ryan. Okay. So, you know, if we wrote an employee plus one policy, right, and I married Mary, okay, you as an employer might have to recognize that. And that might put you in a spot, right, if it was, if I was denominating Mary my spouse. So... I just instead write a policy with you as the employer that says you're going to cover every employee plus one. Now immediately you can see the problem. If Ryan is very, very sickly, doesn't look like it, but if he is, right? I might say as the employee, wow, I'm gonna auction off my plus one slot to the sickest person in the room and we can share the gains. You know, you'd pay something for that because you could be on my policy. Employee plus one is not a complete solution. I'm not trying to say that it is. But it is a clever way to try to allow employers to do the good things that they want to do without having to recognize relationships that they believe they can't recognize. It gets us to both of those goods. And it avoids a worse outcome. So some of you may or may not know that under the ACA, Spouses are not mandatory dependents. In other words, nothing makes you right spousal coverage as an employer. In fact, we learned recently that UPS wasn't going to do it anymore, not because they're a religious employer, right, but because they don't want to spend the money anymore for whatever reason. So when the state doesn't have the power necessarily to make you do these things and religious folks have a particular roadblock to doing it, it's incumbent upon us to try to actually get them out of that problem because they continue to do the good that society is asking them to do. And we know, at least in the District of Columbia, you'll remember, Bill, that we did not provide a specific reframing of this question for employers. So some employers stopped writing spousal life insurance coverage altogether for all of their employees because they couldn't bring themselves to recognize certain relationships. And those are the bad outcomes that I think that we want to avoid. Now I want to talk about this map for just a second. This is the map that you made reference to. This is the Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, or SOGI, non-discrimination laws in America. Every place that's blue or light blue says you ought not to be treating people differently, firing them. Uh, just because they're gay or trans. And I think probably everybody in this room thinks that's right. So why is this entire map not blue? That's the question. And part of the answer is a, que is a question that's actually become very important in Pennsylvania recently, and it's the question of bathroom access. Particularly, you've seen it in schools. But the bathroom issue, some of us think, just came sort of out of nowhere in the last year in North Carolina. Or if you were paying a little bit more attention, you know that it was the bathroom narrative and the idea that somehow by giving sexual orientation, gender identity protections, and public accommodations, you were allowing sex offenders to harm people. That was the question. That was the claim. And we think, oh, well, we know it tanked the Houston Hero Ordinance, right? Well, it turns out it goes a lot farther back. It goes back specifically to the very last, I'll show you in a minute, sexual orientation, gender identity, state law passed in America, and that was Colorado. 
and it came up after the Colorado governor signed that law into law. And since then, we have not seen a single SOGI protection in America at the state level. Now, we have seen things staggered in, and I can tell you about that in questions. Now, some people say this is a question of safety, okay? And there are some stories that went viral. This one may actually be fake news uh, of ladies being taken out of public bathrooms and movie theaters in North Carolina because, oh my God, you know, they are trans. Now, I do not personally see how taking those ladies, if they were taken out of that bathroom, did anything to advance safety at all, okay? And in fact, North Carolina, which has been brutally punished, hundreds of millions of dollars of lost travel income and boycotts and all of this, right? They are hard pressed to explain the safety narrative. Go read the affidavits filed in their litigation. There's something like 57 different paragraphs of logical assumptions that have to fall in place for the safety narrative to really uh, pertain. And one of the things both of the affidavits make clear that were filed by FBI agents and, sh and longtime sheriffs is that they have not a single reported case of a trans person hurting anybody anywhere. Instead, this logical chain of links is all about some sexual predator, and I see a police officer with us, sir, but the idea is that some sexual predator is going to walk into a bathroom and that they're going to be better able to walk into this bathroom and prey on people that they could prey on right now because of a SOGI law. That's the claim. So I took a few of these boxes, and I tried to make them a little bit bigger for you, but you can see this one on the far right, number 42. With gender identity access, it'll be harder to be sure that an offense, hand me my phone, would you, real quick, that an offense has actually happened. Well, we know that that's actually not true, so think about the Target case, right? So there was a case in Target where a trans woman was supposed to have, you know, done this. Reached over and over a fitting room wall and taken a video of the young lady in the next stall. Now that, tell me, sir, is illegal today. I'm sure it is. Okay, it turns out in, in Idaho that's a felony. But one of the claims that was made is if you have a SOGI non-discrimination protection law, the lady in the stall next door isn't going to know that that was a crime. But Chris, you know that's a crime, right? You're going to get right? He knows that's a crime. And so did you. You didn't have to come to the law school to learn that. And neither did this lady or her mama, right? They both reported that, and that's the reason this young person, pictured here in the mugshot, was actually taken into custody. So the whole architecture of the safety claim doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I told you I was going to run out of time. But I do think there is one place with the SOGI laws where there are safety claims. I'm going to talk about a friend of mine named Bree who is genderqueer. This is somebody I spent some time with recently in Alaska. And when I met him, he had a beard about full out like Ryan's. Um, and um, a biker jacket on. He's in a group called BACA, Bikers Against Child Abuse. It's a great organization, by the way. And um, he's all buff looking, hot. And then he tells me, oh, well, I also, on the weekends, go out. And he shows me a picture on the phone of himself. I'm looking at the picture, and I'm looking at Bree, and I'm like, damn, you look good. And he's dressed as a woman. I would have never, except for exactly studying his face, I would have never known. And then what he told me was that in Alaska, he believes that when he is dressed to go out on the weekends as a woman, he has to use the men's room because he thinks that's Alaska law. I don't think it is, by the way, but he does. And you know how that goes down? He comes out of the stall, and there's a man using the urinal, and then that's when that person says, what the hell are you doing in here? And then Bree answers in his very dark, you know, very deep, excuse me, voice, this is where I'm supposed to be. And that's when they talk about going out back to fight. Bree, when he is in the biker jacket and the full out beard, he belongs in the men's room. But when he's dressed on the weekends, I think he probably belongs in the women's room. Or at least that's a question I think that has to be had around these laws. But in a dispassionate way, not in a way to block social progress about sexual orientation 
and gender identity non-discrimination laws, but to engage directly whether there's really a thing here. And then I'm getting, so let me just make this last point about uh, two things that I think are actually holding up the ability to change that map and all those parts that were white to actually protect people from illicit discrimination in housing and in hiring and public accommodations based on the fact that they're gay or trans. And that is the bathroom narrative. You can see that when it started in 2008, which was back with that last Colorado law, we have never again seen a statewide measure passed because of the bathroom narrative. And we're seeing a very similar thing around the bakers. And I can just show you more sort of reporting on the bakers, the rise of the baker narrative. Okay, the idea here is that if we protect LGBT people from discrimination, then somebody is gonna pay the price and that's gonna be the religious baker that doesn't wanna put you know, the, the cake topper on with two men or two women. Now, I'm not trying to make light of that religious conviction. I think many of those folks really do believe that they are facilitating a relationship they can't facilitate. But it seems to me that the way that narrative is being used is to say we can't have any sexual orientation, gender identity law, quote, however nuanced, because this might happen. Well, you know, it turns out if you go back and look at all the famous baker cases, right, from Masterpiece Cakes to the Flores case to uh, Baronel Stutzman's in Washington State, have some of these people had the boom dropped on them under state law? Yes, they have. But partly because every one of those state laws were written without marriage equality in mind. They were not written with the question of peaceful coexistence in mind. So they, yes, are indictment of laws that are lopsided, laws that had one thing in mind and not a peaceful coexistence. But I don't think they tell us that we should do nothing. In fact, I think the fork that we stand at right now is do we just accept that map with all that white? Or do we say, wait a minute, there must be ways where we can in fact, in this context, be more tolerant, to be more accepting of the fact that we don't completely agree on everything, whether it's the nature of marriage or our duties to each other, but we should be able to agree that every place, every person should have the ability to make a living, should have a place to live, whatever their sexuality, whatever their gender identity is. If we can't agree on that, then actually, then that's a pretty dim picture about tolerance, which is why we hope that Chris is going to give us better answers. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, um, so I'm, I'm glad and, and really honored to be here uh, today uh, on this panel, and I feel compelled to begin by mentioning the obvious, which is that you know I'm a bit less qualified than the previous speakers, um, and so I've dealt you know less formally um, and less rigorously with this topic, um, you know, but still the question, uh, what tolerance means, is equally important to me, and you know I think that. It's relevant to me, and, and I've dealt with it in intimate ways, as we all have, and we all must. Um, you know, first, because we coexist, you know, with many people who are different from we are. Um, second, because we all wish to advance our interests and those of our communities. And third, because, in my view, we best satisfy those interests only when we, at the very least, tolerate one another. Now, um, let me begin by saying that the tolerance, you know, in this case, in, in satisfying, you know, all our interests, and advancing all our interests uh, and narrowing societal divide, um, you know, is merely a necessary and not a sufficient condition. Um, you know, in other words, tolerance, um, while important, is still not enough. Um, that being said, we, we are here to talk about uh, what tolerance means, at least I am. And so to me, I think that the way I think about tolerance is as a series of choices. Um, you know, first, I think that tolerance involves choosing uh, a certain mindfulness. And you know, as this relates to today's topic, uh, you know, this would mean that as a religious person, you know, advocating, say, against gay marriage, um, <coughs> you realize that, you know, there are real lives at stake. Um, you know, there are people who, like you, have friends, families, goals, and who rightfully feel like you are saying to them 
that they aren't worthy of or deserving of marriage the way straight people are. You know, so, so basically, I think tolerance first means owning up to your decisions and beliefs, um, acknowledging legitimate claims that other people have, and realizing that your choices and beliefs can either build these other people up or it can do harm to them. You know, I, I, think, I think then um, tolerance goes actually a step further, um, and it means to do no harm. Um, and this is in a specific sense of the word um, harm. Harm, I think, in this case, uh, means to dehumanize, stigmatize, or to take it upon yourself to de facto deprive someone else of their legal rights. Basically, it means refusing to say, refusing to say or act in a way that indicates that what makes someone different, whether it be their race, their religion, their beliefs, also makes them lesser in some way. Further, I think tolerance must apply in both ways. I have the right to disagree with you, and you have the right to disagree with me. So I think then people who espouse arguments I find repulsive or fundamentally wrong can, in some cases, still be tolerant people. For instance, I think there are tolerant people who believe that gay marriage should not be legal, even though I disagree. I think there's, I think there's no way around this um, when it comes to a conception of tolerance either, because you know, if tolerance means permitting only of the arguments we agree with, then we'd be violating some potential person's right to disagree which in the end is not tolerance at all. Finally, tolerance means both acknowledging that none of us will have as good an understanding of other people as they do themselves, but still, with this knowledge, attempting to understand other people. No serious attempt at tolerance, in my view, goes without actually talking to, interacting with, and listening to people with whom we disagree. This is, of course, easy to say in principle, and often has barriers in practice but in any case, I think it's quite clear that isolation and separation preclude one's ability to understand different people, to tolerate them, and surely to ever accept them. Tolerance in practice, to me, helps to uphold those things we hold near and dear. First, freedom of dissent, or the freedom to not be dehumanized for one's own beliefs. Second, freedom of choice, the freedom for people to love who they want or to pray to the God that they believe in. And third, a sense of community, a connectedness in both a literal and figural sense, figurative sense among people from both similar and different backgrounds. Thank you. Before I begin, I would also like to thank uh, my fellow speakers and the, school, the law school and the university for hosting this event today. Now, most Americans agree that tolerance is an important virtue, and incidentally, most Americans view themselves as tolerant. Research shows that most people believe that they exhibit positive values through their lives and through their actions. But this belief persists even among, say, white supremacists and people who commit hate crimes. Individuals regard themselves as tolerant, quote unquote, as long as they are not actively, physically, uh, consciously oppressing someone who identifies or is defined as a member of a minority group. Many people seem to think that either you're tolerant, case closed, or you're not. I think that this view of tolerance is too narrow, that it is more useful to consider tolerance as a kind of spectrum. To be tolerant is not an isolated social construct, but a midpoint between more extreme social relations. On the one end of the spectrum, you know, we see uh, familiarity, acceptance, the value of other human beings. On the other hand, uh, we see the results of intolerance leading to social and institutional contempt, discrimination, and violence. As Chris said, uh, simple tolerance then is not a sufficient condition for equal <clears throat> excuse me for equality, but it is a necessary component. The importance of moving beyond a, a simplistic view of tolerance uh, was thrown into sharp relief for me with the birth of my first son in 2013. Joshua was born with Down syndrome, a genetic condition that in some ways means that he is a more vulnerable member of our society. For our family, Joshua's needs have illustrated the difference between uh, simple tolerance and full acceptance. The former is merely a kind of minimum requirement for participating in society, uh, allowing another person or group of people to exist. 
Society's legacy of denying that recognition persists today behind a veneer of tolerance that is applied to people with disabilities and in a more general sense, and as we've seen in great detail in our society and here today, it's something that's applied to all people who are perceived as different. These patterns emerge again and again uh, across our society, throughout different communities, and in social systems. The systematic injustices that continue to plague communities of color, immigrant communities, LGBTQ communities and individuals, women, religious minorities, the list just goes on. And this is protected and excused because Western society has not progressed, I think, beyond mere tolerance. Some people remain stuck at this kind of midpoint, the middle of this spectrum, and uh, are content to remain in this sort of limbo. More troubling, we've seen uh, recently the dangers of a kind of begrudging tolerance that easily evaporates and leaves people allowing or accepting or even supporting the oppression of others. Now again, most people perceive of themselves as good, but having good intentions is not enough to make that perception true. Being simply tolerant is not adequate when the goal should be full acceptance of people different from oneself because we're all members of a larger community. All too often we encounter or have experienced or heard of, you know, we, we see too often firsthand, the hurtful moralizing narratives that some people use to paint LGBTQ people as different. And the pain and the turmoil that can occur, especially when young people are outed or come out to their families. It's estimated that LGBTQ youth make up between, between 10 and 12% of all youth in our country, but 40% of all homeless youth. There are parents who literally cannot tolerate the idea that their child is suddenly the other. Someone who seems different from who they thought, or perhaps someone that they suddenly see is different from themselves. But other narratives and values are important to these families too. For example, the role of family. Now too often families' experiences in this regard are negative. These values get forgotten or twisted. But when families don't reject their LGBTQ children, when they lean on or adapt their own beliefs and values in a constructive, affirming way, these kids are much more likely to have positive outcomes in life. Research shows that 92% of LGBTQ kids in accepting families are confident that they will be happy adults. Their statistical likelihood for risky behaviors, depression, mental health issues, STDs, HIV, and a whole host of other threats to their health and well-being drop by hundreds of percents. What parent does not want this for their child? What parent would not want their child to be happy? I'm not suggesting that all family problems can be fixed, that everyone will suddenly be reconciled and rainbows will fly through the air. Um, by helping parents see better futures for their children as LGBT children. Nor am I implying that things will be easy if we simply remind people that they profess to believe in the power of families and of keeping families together. But I do think that tapping into and converting existing cultural and religious frameworks, frameworks that speak to rural and conservative families, some of the same families who are most at risk for rejecting their children because they lack the information that leads to tolerance and understanding, could be a powerful way to turn risk factors for LGBT folks into strengths. My own family has been very fortunate to have worked with people, doctors, therapists, teachers, who do not merely tolerate our precious little boy, but who welcome and accept him. One thing that you learn quickly about many families in the disability community is that parents can be fierce and ceaseless advocates for their children. Now, I heard from a woman in Indiana, Pennsylvania, a few weeks ago about how when she found out that her son was gay five years ago, she sought out a network of supportive LGBTQ welcoming churches in Western Pennsylvania. At their regional gathering, she found a table for parents and there were two other people sitting there. When she attended the same regional gathering this year, there were over 230. 
These are families who do not merely tolerate their children, as our cultural narrative seems to suggest that they should. They love their children and advocate fiercely within a Christian framework, no less, for their children's rights and full inclusion in society. So tolerance can come in degrees. And people who have achieved some degree of tolerance cannot be complacent. The ambivalence that lurks within tolerance implies limitation. It suggests that one has done enough, that one is good enough, simply because of the existence of other people. While this is obviously a necessary first step, we as a society can and must build on the opportunities that tolerance provides. We must all take on and lead others to take on the difficult work of engaging with experiences and narratives that are different from our own. This is the critical component, I think, and perhaps kind of the uncertain point at which many people in our society now find themselves between the road back into our society's legacy of thin tolerance that really just cloaks distrust and violence and contempt and the path forward to greater tolerance and genuine respect. Thank you. Wow, those were really great. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, and we have a little bit of time now for questions and discussions. This is about dialogue. Um, we still have about seven minutes left to tweet, so um, keep doing that. Uh, we have a a mic here, so I'm going to throw out a question to the group and then we'll open it up to questions from you all. So um, raise your hand and, and Kim or someone will find you. But I just want to start by asking, I really was struck both um, Chris and David, uh, you both made reference to, in your own way, the importance of everybody kind of doing a, a self-check and owning up was the language that you used, Chris, to what your beliefs are and your choices are. And I think that's really struck me in a very powerful way. And you both made reference to um, you know, steps that you can take to try to become more understanding and accepting and tolerant and inclusive. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I just would like to ask anybody on the panel if you have any ideas for um, specific suggestions because I think we all recognize that we live in a society that's increasingly polarized and people talk to people who are like them and hang out with people who are like them and live near people who are like them. What is it that people can do to actually find the people to talk to, to initiate conversation, relationship, um, take those first steps? Any ideas? Well, come to events like this one and uh, exchange conversations afterwards with us, with each other. Um, the Utah statute that Robin and I have talked about and that Robin was engaged in, uh, the LDS Church and Equality Utah, which is the LGBT group, uh, reached out to one another. And they initiated a series of get to know you um, coffees and whatnot at a, at a, at a neutral house. Uh, I think it's actually very useful. Uh, I've talked to a number of the Utah legislators who worked with Robin, uh, and these are very, you know, strong, conservative Republican legislators, and almost all of them were in tears at what they learned when they talked to their own children who knew homeless youth, who talked to uh, LGBT people who had their own journey stories. And likewise, the uh, LGBT people, when they heard the religious journey stories, were very moved that, that these people were coming from a position of principle and faith and not just dislike of gay people. So I really do think that a useful thing would be like individual small uh, sessions where each person just tell her or his stories. Uh, and then, you know, get to know each other. But it, it, it really does often have to be organized. You don't just run to these folks in the supermarket lot. It doesn't just happen in the Starbucks. Well, I mean, you run into them, but you don't know that this person is a devout religious opponent of marriage equality. You know that that person is a cross-dresser. You know, et cetera. I don't know anyway. <laughs> okay. That's one approach. I just wanted to make the point that I think that you know, it, we don't interact 
oftentimes with people who are different from ourselves, not because the opportunities uh, don't exist. You know, there are people all around us every day who are different from us. It's that we don't, we aren't willing to interact with these people um, who are different from us. You know, it feels comfortable to be around somebody who either looks like you or agrees with you or prays to the same God as you, things like that. And, and I think that, so what it comes down to then is finding it within yourself or, or recognizing that other people's interests are your own too. You know, we are coexisting together, and you know, the only way you can advance your own interest, advance your own interests, is to advance everybody's interests. <laughs> All right, I have two quick questions. The first one: Does the tolerance we're talking about differentiate between? loving or accepting a person and accepting what they do? Or is it one package, you accept me, that means you accept what I do? Second quick question is, um, and maybe this is for the organizer, I feel the whole panel is pro-LGBT, um, so there is no other one um, from the other side. Because I personally, in my personal ignorance, I would say, I disagree with every single argument that has been raised today, except one that every single person needs to be understood, loved, um, listened to, and, and, and have the right to, to marry, have children, and be happy. Every single person on this globe have this right. But there's, it was not raised that there are things that, no, this is not the way that should be done. And I see, personally, Maybe I'm an ignorant immigrant that the problem, there is a problem that I can see in America that it is okay to do whatever you want. And everything is okay. Sure, you want this? Okay, let's do it. I think no, there are things that are not okay. It, 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 it is about principles. No, this is not the things that should be done. This is, not, this is how I'm formed, I'm framed. Maybe this is ignorant in some, in your eyes, but um, I see this is a problem, that it is okay to do whatever you want to do, and we will make it happen, and we'll make a law to get, to get through, and we'll, what you want to do will make it happen. Thank you. Mary, may I say something to this gentleman? Sure. Um, don't be in any way apologetic. That was a very thoughtful and wonderful statement that you just made. Um, and I think it does remind us, yeah, you, you've got to have both sides. You, you, LGBT people and their supporters need to speak to principled people of faith. And, and here's something to be said in favor of, of, of thin tolerance, okay? One thing to be favor, said in favor of thin tolerance, and this is the position often taken by the Roman Catholic Church, many evangelical churches, uh, many prominent Muslim scholars, for example, uh, and that is to love individuals but strongly disagree with the moral quality of what they stand for, what they're doing. Uh, and so one way that tolerance can work, and I think it does work in America this way, <clears throat> is to say that, that people need honestly to exchange viewpoints in a way where they don't feel that they are being denigrated as people. Uh, and one of the things we've got to avoid, and this is true in universities as well as in churches, we want to avoid the echo chamber where you only talk to people who agree with what you're saying, okay? Uh, but I think that's much what tolerance is all about. It's, it's a, the twin sibling of pluralism, that we are gonna have groups and people in the United States that strongly disagree with one another. And I think that's good. Set forth your point of view, and anything goes point of view, criticize it. Stand against it. This is why it's bad for you, bad for society. And here's what's good. And one of the things I like personally about gay marriage is people like April DeBoer and Jane Rouse. That you can disagree with whether two lesbians should have a committed relationship. But it's very hard to disagree with what they've done for these five children. Uh, some of them were children born of um, mothers who had drug addictions or even AIDS. 
and these two women were willing to adopt them. And that should be encouraged. And so we should look for all the various kinds of stories, including things we strongly disagree with. So thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Let me shake your hand afterwards. Well, I'll shake your hand now, but well, I'll, shake, I'll shake your hand now. Someone else talk. Well, I go ahead and shake your hand. Hey, Bill. While you're shaking hands, I wanted to actually say a word, too. First, I just wanted to thank you for being here. Um, my son's father is a naturalized citizen. This whole country is full of immigrants. If we look far enough back with the slice of people, you know, with the exception of folks who, um, you know, are Native American, right? So uh, I think it's what makes the country great. I think you ask exactly the right question. And I don't think anybody here meant to avoid the hard merits question of, you know, what counts as marriage. But I do think that we took as a starting point the U.S. Supreme Court's recent decision in Obergefell recognizing same-sex marriage. And then once that's recognized, there's a set of downstream questions that I think are really important um, to people of faith too, right? Which is, what, what does it mean as a person of faith, for example, to think about LGBT persons? You know, frequently when I'm talking to folks, one of the challenges that I have to them is, I get where you're coming from on marriage. Maybe you don't think that was the right thing for the court. But the question we have now is whether people should be respected and treated without respect to their sexual orientation or gender identity in housing or in hiring or in public accommodations. And I think there it's hard for people of faith to say that someone should not have a place to live or the ability to make a living. I personally think that that's a hard position to get behind. Now, some folks would say, and I've had folks say this to me in Washington, that it's not loving to protect gay people from discrimination. That's a quote. And what they meant was that if you make it easy for folks to have a place to live or a way to make a living, that they're more likely to be gay. Now, I think, you know, I don't know enough about these questions, whether, you know, people make choices or, you know, or people have a certain orientation or not. But my particular view of faith is that it, as a person of faith, I would want, that faith is non-negotiable. It can't be wrung out of me, okay? And if that's central and core to who I am, how can I say to someone else about their sexuality, which is central or core to who they are, that you ought not to have that. In fact, I think it's in the interest of people of faith to recognize that other people have deep identities too. And if they want to hold on to their identities as people of faith, they need to leave that room for other people to be who they are. And that's one conception of tolerance we haven't, you sort of touched on, and David did too, all of us have. But I think is probably the, the clearest response to your question. Totally legit question, I'm really glad you raised it. Hi. Um, so I am struggling a little bit um, with the idea of tolerance always being a good thing um, for certain ideologies, mindsets, etc. And it really makes harkens back to the James Baldwin quote, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. And so that's kind of where I tend to draw the line on being able to be tolerant when the views are rooted in mine or someone else's oppression, denial of humanity, or right to exist. And so I, I, don't really, I didn't really feel like that was kind of touched on in the conversations that you guys gave. And so I wanted to see kind of what your thought process was on that when, you know, it's not just we're disagreeing on something here. We're disagreeing on, on people's lives or people's humanity. I think it's a great question. Let me flip the question away from the way it's usually directed. You know, in most of my lifetime, it's been directed uh, that anti-gay intolerance is, is bad <clears throat> because it denies gay people's, you know, fundamental humanity. Uh, I think one of the fears that we're now seeing in states like Pennsylvania and other states that are confronted with these liberty equality clashes, uh, fundamentalist churches whether you're Catholic or 
Orthodox Jew or Muslim or uh, Evangelical Christian feel that they are the ones now who are the minority being demonized, often by universities and policymakers and by the US Supreme Court. You know, some of the dissenting justices raised that point. Uh, and so I think that's a, the James Baldwin admonition, I think is a very good admonition uh, for those of us who are now more in the majority than we ever were before, people who support same-sex marriage. I was never in the majority on that until very, very recently. <clears throat> and I think it's, it's absolutely wrong for those of us who are in the majority on that now to use that to condemn, discriminate, or oppress uh, people who sincerely, but in a principled way, disagree with us. Now again, I think the force of the law you know, is, is gonna still create clashes. But I think demonizing our opponents is absolutely the wrong way to go. And urging uh, that, that they be excluded from civil society, I think is also the wrong way to go. Um, can, can I put, oh, I was gonna, I was gonna. Please follow up. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So I think you kind of misunderstood a little bit of my, I, my point. I wasn't, so <clears throat> I brought up the quote, not necessarily to protect the people who are now in the minority that oppose same-sex marriage, but to protect the people in marginalized communities, the LGBTQIA, regardless of whether we as a society now, the majority of people embrace that, LGBTQIA people are still marginalized among other groups people. And so my, my thing was, how, it's hard to, to ask for tolerance from marginalized people when that tolerance is supposed to be of other people who deny their oppression, I mean, who, who their disagreement is rooted in their oppression, their denial, their denial of their right to exist or their humanity. And so for me, that's something that I don't think that we can be tolerant of. That doesn't mean that we can't be tolerant of people who disagree with same-sex marriage, but if they're actively advocating against <laughs> these things happening, and, and, we, and the Supreme Court has said that that is a right for people to have, then you are advocating a right in denial of my, of my, of what, of, if I'm LGBTQ, one of my rights. So that was kind of my thing. Where we can't always, can we, can we really be tolerant of everything? I don't think we can be tolerant of every opinion or everything because sometimes that would be include being tolerant of the KKK or promoting some of the racist ideologies and things that have existed previously. Well, the irony there is we are tolerant of the KKK. You know, it is not illegal in the United States to, you know, advocate white supremacy, as hateful as that is. But that's an irony. Uh, here's the other irony, and that is within the LGBTQIA community. Um, Same-sex marriage has created new divisions and new marginalizations. We shouldn't sugarcoat that. That uh, civil marriage does not benefit uh, a lot of the LGBTQI community. And, you know, I'm afraid that's, that's another conundrum. And I'll just tail on, and I think Chris had a point to make too. To, just very quickly, you're right, the, the court spoke to a right to marry. But the downstream questions, do you have a right to spousal benefits? Do you have a right to live someplace? And without respect to your sexual orientation? Do you have the right to work at UPS and not be fired? Not that UPS is doing this, I'm not trying to suggest that. I'm picking a commercial group as opposed to a religious group right now, right? But you know, the, those things are the subject of the debate in the states right now about how far the quote rights go. And you'll know, and Chris certainly will at Yale, you know, there are these sources of law, the Constitution, a Burgafell is one of them. But lots and lots, the most, in fact, of our law is positive law that comes from legislators themselves. And they're in the process of answering this question. And I think for them to give back the answer that I think you would want, right, which is, you know, I'm like everybody else. Why would I get the short end of the stick? That's a totally legitimate question for them to give the positive protections people need in the law, they've got to figure out some way from their perspective not to be harming religion along the way. Now, you make a totally legitimate point. 
that it seems like, well, between this historically oppressed minority group and big religion, which has kind of like had its way forever and ever and ever, right? Shouldn't we pick that one? And I think there's a lot to be said for that. But right now, the level playing field is that, that some of those religious believers are finding themselves in the minority for the first time. So they are trying to, they are acting in some ways as minorities and saying, now I'm the oppressed one. And I think for legislators caught in the middle, trying to write rules where everybody can peacefully coexist, that's a tough spot. I don't think it helps them to try to decide which one is more oppressed. Their job is going to be to write those positive rules that allow both communities to coexist, I think. And if I can just pick up on just a term that you used and expand on that a little bit, I think something else that might be a constructive language to consider in this debate is, and you, and you said it, harm, harm, and specifically harm reduction. So when people have to weigh different opinions and different uh, perspectives, what, which of those creates more harm for more people? And this is a very kind of utilitarian way that it's coming out, uh, and I don't necessarily mean it that way, but when we look at, say for example, health disparities among historically marginalized communities, there is no question that African American communities, uh, many immigrant communities, LGBT people, in uh, disproportionately suffer more harm. And that is a concrete, everyday reality for many people, whether that's in their um, physical health, whether it's mental health, whether it's reflected in housing. Um, you know, there's just this myriad of things that we can quantitatively track and uh, in many cases trace back not only to the kinds of dialogue that we're having, but to the legislation that comes out of those. So I don't mean to uh, suggest that there's you know, one right answer for that, but I think it's useful to keep in mind when we talk about one group's rights and one group being oppressed versus another group uh, historically being oppressed uh, in, in very concrete ways. Um, I would love to take more questions, but we are short of time, and so I want to wrap it up um, by saying I think we've gotten a good start on thinking about ways in our individual lives, in our collective lives, in our kind of civic lives to think about ways to engage in dialogue and to think about the meaning of tolerance and perhaps some limits, appropriate limits on tolerance. Um, so I really want to thank all of you all for coming. I want to thank everybody who has been out there tweeting and you, you won one of the prizes. Make sure you um, connect with Robin afterwards and especially want to thank all of our speakers today. So thank you.